and that cities will have to become smart. We will have to have smart infrastructure. We will have to digitalize the various components of that make up a city. Productive elements, residential elements, transportation elements will become increasingly digitalized. We have huge advances in the application of AI and learning algorithms and how to manage these various parts of urban development. That's why I am obsessed about the need for global interaction, global governance and global solidarity. If we could do it globally, this is what will help. And it's globally, we need all of us working together. This light at the end of the tunnel that comes with vaccines has to shine for all. Globalist, globalism, it isn't that some konspirationsteoretiker och nationalister och populister slänger sig med sådana här uttryck. Nej. Det är faktiskt så att det är en, en ideologi där man vill centralisera hela världen och avskaffa nationer och gränser av en rad olika, många olika skäl. Allt från liksom att man ska kunna ha arbetskraft som strömmar över gränserna och man ska liksom kunna skrämma stora grupper av folk från ett ställe till nästa så att de hamnar helt vilsna på ett område och blir utnyttjade och kan jobba billigt och gratis. Så skrämmer undan nästa grupp och så flyttar du runt folk så, där så att de blir totalt eh, rotlösa liksom. Det finns inget som gör att man liksom bryr sig om just den här platsen just nu och det här folket som bor här eftersom allt är bara en stor röra liksom. Och då får man istället fokusera på att älska världen och det gör man i form av att man blir man ger sig i luftstriden. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. Bra. kämpa för klimatet så att det inte ska bli 1,5 grader varmare. För det vore ju hemskt. Så blir det alltid de där. Alltså det, det är de det, det är det de vill åt. Liksom. Det är globalister. Globalism. Så det är ett fullt eh, verkligt ord faktiskt. Eh, sen har det ju fått en dålig klang och det är med rätta. Så det är kanske inte därför en del människor använder sig av det ordet för att ja, de tror massa saker om det som inte stämmer då. Men det ska bli liksom elbilar och kollektivboende där du sop, sorterar ihop med några andra människor. Och du ska vara övervakad. Städer ska styras av AI för att göra allting effektivare och smidigare. Sådana saker. Det ser vi redan nu. Med de här vaxpassen. Man pratar ju om globala problem. Som kräver globala lösningar. Det, här, det där har ni hört för. Och det är därför som den här klimatskärmen finns. Också nu då den här våta drömmen C19. Som gör att man kan skynda på det här ännu snabbare. Och trycka på att det är ännu viktigare att man jobbar ihop globalt. Men det är väl bra att man samarbetar, säger någon då. Ja, och det stämmer det är ju. Men det är inte bra att lämna bort sin makt till en handfull typer som ska bestämma över en hel värld. Som inte har någon insikt i hur det ser ut. <hör> På massa andra, för ingen människa kan ju vara på alla platser i hela världen och hinna lära känna de platserna. Utan det gör ju de som bor där. Lokalkännedomen liksom, det har ju alla dem. Men det blir som att styra, sköta ett grönsaksland då. Kratta bort lite där och sen så elda bara lite svedjebruk där. Och här planterar vi några frön här och här ska vi dra bort lite ogräs. Och här behövs det lite pestkontroll så här ska vi bespruta lite. <laughs> ja. 
Man kan tycka sig att Sverige är annorlunda nu jämfört med andra länder som till exempel Australien som har gått all in liksom på totalitära beteenden. Each local government areas will now be required to wear masks outdoors. If someone is legitimately claiming they've got a health condition, I have no doubt that the police will be listening to that. But some people are just being belligerent. No questions, nothing. You didn't ask any questions. You just literally sure, sure, grabbed me. Exemption. Medical exemption. Where's my apology, mate? Get off of me! He's fucking choking me! Fucking choking me, dude! What the fuck? You got fucked in the head! What the fuck are you doing to me? What have I done? You just gave me your fucking belt! You're choking her! It's a man on a girl and you yeah, choked her. For what? For not having a mask? Men Sverige är väldigt insultad i de här globalistiska agendorna. Vi är med i alla såna jävla avtal och skit. Överenskommelse. Vi skriver under allt sånt där. Och jobbar med hållbarhet och sustainability. Och det tjatas om klimatet hela tiden, överallt. Och alla politiker... Pappegojar samma saker. Det är en korrupt jävla skock av charlataner. Det är SDG sen. Och alltså Sustainability Development Goals. Va? Men det, det som är, det är en grej som jag... Det är därför jag gör det här nu. Det man måste tänka på. Det är att även om vi inte har haft hårda lockdowns och allt det där. Och vart annorlunda. Så i och med att vi är med i det så kallade globala kompiskretsen. Så räcker det med att det skrivs på ett sånt här jävla avtal. Där massa länder kommer överens med någon slags tvång. För allas bästa. Och då måste Sverige följa dem, följa det. Och då har vi den här. Ja då är det här liksom. Då händer det. För att eh, Sverige skulle direkt skriva på något sånt här. Garanterat. Och då startar övergreppen liksom. Då, då, blir, då är vi där. Men svenskarna, vi luras ju. Vi vaggas till söms hela tiden. Hela tiden det är så här, det är så chilligt här för oss på något sätt. Vi kan liksom vandra omkring i det här tucknet. Utan att riktigt behöva bry oss så mycket om saker och ting. För att det, det, går ju bra, det går ju bra liksom. Det går ju bra här. För många människor gör det. det de har ju bara ett så här liv med jobb, familj och så, det är så här vanligt liv. Liksom. De tänker inte på såna här saker. Först är för sent. För det kan liksom kan gå jävligt fort om en sån där grej sker. Så det man måste göra nu det är att man måste se upp för de här avtalen som skrivs under. För de kan skrivas under när vi kollar åt andra hållet. Helt klart. Och de kan vara inbakade i något annat. De kan liksom smygas med någon slags klimatavtal kanske. Att det är klimatviktigt att bli besprutad. Liksom. Typ så. Ni vet hur de gör. De formulerar ju trixar liksom hela tiden. Sådär. Jag hörde att de ville ha 20% av hela världen. And then we hope this year to reach 20%. Uh, Injicerad och färdig 2021. Men att de kanske inte riktigt skulle lyckas med det då. Vissa länder har ju klart gått jävligt bra. Israel och vad är det mer? Så Sverige har ju lyckats också jävligt bra verkar det som. Men som sagt. Glöm inte att vi är del i den här globala maffiastrukturen. Och så gott som alla svenska politiker och folk i topppositioner. De är liksom med i den här klubben. Det bara är så. Det, det ser man hela tiden. Ibland lite dåligare, men många gånger är det helt rakt öppet alltså, vad de gör och vad de står för. Så vi får se upp nu. Hur som helst så 
efter den här långa inledningen så det som den här videon gick ut på det var faktiskt att jag hittade en Youtube-kanal för World Government Summit. De hade en liten kanal. Och det är ju ändå en sån här sammansvägning liksom typ som World Economic Forum och Davos. Det är en sån där pryl liksom. Där eh, stora tänkare och eh, toppfolk och företagsledare och så vidare, aktivister eh, konspirerar för den här stora och globala drömmen som de har då. Så jag eh, klippte ut lite välvalda bitar ur eh, en av deras videos. Kolla gärna in den kanalen, det är ganska intressant att se. Det är det gamla vanliga snacket lite. Så här kommer det. Mycket nöje. Where is the global collaboration gone and when it comes to such a global pandemic like this and is it fun fallen unfairly on the shoulders of the developing world as a result? Thanks a lot. Uh, I mean it's clear to all of us who are working on this pandemic whether we're in the United Nations, in a big business or in leading governments, that none of us are safe until we're all safe. None of us is secure until we're all secure. None of us will be prosperous until we all have an opportunity to participate in global economic activity. Any sense that somehow this pandemic can be dealt with by a small group of nations vaccinating all their people and then and only then giving vaccine uh, to the rest of the world is just not the right way to do it. I, I don't know quite how long it's going to take world leaders who got vaccines to come to terms with the reality that sharing and doing it together is the only way to go. But I hope it's quick. Here's my reasoning. Number one, this virus is not staying constant. It's ever changing. virus is not staying constant. It's ever changing. It's ever changing. And that means that it really is essential that all nations and their leaders work together and deal with it as a common issue globally. Number two, the, the current situation on vaccine supplies is just not satisfactory. Uh, the, there are a small number of nations who are trying to outbid each other for access to the vaccines that are available. And that free for all doesn't work. And so finally, unless we do this as a global coordinated program, I have quite major worries that we will be likely in the next six months or one year looking at each other and saying, where did we go wrong? Why don't we get it right now by dealing with, this, with it as a global problem rather than as a parochial issue? Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Navarro. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Henrietta, you wanted to follow up with President Saul. Yes, thank you, John. So President Saul is outlining the importance from a national perspective. So if these first vaccines can vaccinate 3% of frontline workers, and then we hope this year to reach 20%, but with the Africa Union, our request is 60%. To David Navarro's point, we don't think we can do this in 2021, but if we can get more manufacturing of vaccines, we have a chance as the world to get higher than the 20% coverage, which is what we are aiming for this year, 21 for the world. Okay, uh, Sultan bin Suleyman, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask you, what's your call to business? I mean, I know DP World feels very passionate about the partnership with UNICEF uh, and the WTO, and you have the COVAX uh, uh, vaccine program. Uh, do you feel the private sector, and Henrietta was suggesting, let's get the private sector to do as much as possible. Kind of give us a call to arms here for the private sector. Do you think they're being a little remiss and not stepping up uh, at, at an accelerated pace? In my opinion, private capital uh, sector is ready. Uh, I tell you, I give you an example of UAE. UAE actually is a good example. We've been very proactive in dealing with this pandemic. In fact, we have 
uh, in Dubai, the Dubai logistic uh, for vaccine, which is uh, an alliance which includes Emirates Airline, DP World, uh, and all the stakeholders mm. in charge of this. Uh, but when you look at this, it, as I mentioned, it needs the private, but it needs to be led by the government. Government should be on board. Uh, if you look at the economic benefits, and there was a study, if we get the vaccination done, the, the market in the world will, will be at least 153 billion this year. And probably at 25, the world market will increase by 40, 466 billion. So we can see there is a benefit. But it needs government in each country to really lead the private sector. It is a big role and it is a duty. This pandemic will not go away unless everybody pulls in all they have. This is a very, very important effort, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. Uh, in a three-year window, this is the commitment that you've made to, to UNICEF. Do you hope to bring in other private sector partners along the way? I mean, are you actively in, in pursuit of that, Chairman? Absolutely. We're working with manufacturers vaccine, uh, providing for them facilities. Uh, we are, you know, in, in, in over 90 countries, we have facilities in many uh, areas in Africa, in Latin America, logistics. We're the largest logistics company in India. We're the largest in Peru and in Chile. And these are all facilities we are providing. We have a big distribution center in Rwanda, which is ideal for distribution. Uh, we are working with government, we work with manufacturers. Uh, the problem with the vaccine is the unavailability of the vaccines. But even if you have it available, as I mentioned, just distributing the vaccine to everybody is a big effort. It needs a lot of collaborated effort to make this happen. Good. Uh, David, love to get your thoughts here. I see some of the targets that uh, COVAX has laid out suggesting that 5% of current vaccine supplies in the developed world, say the G7 plus up to the G20, should be set aside that amount to go into the developing world. Is this a good benchmark for the future? And, and can that commitment be uh, accelerated itself? Oh, thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, the choice is quite stark, and I really uh, uh, want to appreciate what uh, President Macky Sall, Henrietta Four, and His Excellency uh, Sultan Salayam have been saying. Look, either this is done as a global response, and that means all efforts to get the supplies on stream, to get the logistics in place, to ensure safety of every vaccine that is used, and to ensure that only fully effective vaccines and to ensure that only fully effective vaccines are made available. We've either got to go for those four things globally or we will do piecemeal and COVAX will just have to do what it can with what it has available. I, I want everybody to understand this COVAX scheme is great and it can work well. But if there are a few countries trying to take the majority of the world's vaccine supplies so that the majority of the world has to wait and for the leftovers, it's not right. And so I'm really pleading through this medium for there to be a reassessment of prioritization and for the needs of the world to be put first rather than a small number of countries taking what they have and leaving only a, a relatively limited amount of vaccine and frankly for cash for COVAX to use. It's not the right way to respond to a pandemic of this size and seriousness. Well, it's interesting, Dave, let me follow up. What's the better structure then? And then I'm gonna bring Henrietta into this discussion as well. What would be a better structure? Because it's very difficult through the international organizations to put pressure on their members, as you know, and this is the challenge has been for the WHO since the start of the pandemic. What would you recommend at this stage then? David? Oh, sorry, yes. Well, I mean, there is only one way to do this and that is through international cooperation. We have various hmm. mechanisms available. They're called G7, G20, Security Council, General Assembly, and more. And they all build off regional organizations that are superb, like the African Union. Let's get all these organizations focusing on fair access to vaccines for everybody. 
If that became the watchword for the world in the coming year or two, then the kind of objective that's been set here for immunization, perhaps not by 2021, but at least by 2022, becomes a reasonable prospect. But if we go on with countries working independently, it won't, won't work. So I'm actually saying that I think that we have to use these global mechanisms and get them working to their full potential to deal with this as a global issue that calls for a global response. Okay, very good. Uh, David, why don't you pick up on this? Because I'm very curious what we've learned so far one year into the pandemic and then the rollout of the vaccines and that kind of momentum towards the end of 2020 coming into 2021. But at the World Government Summit, we like to look to the future. What do we learn from this past year that we can take into the future to solve these uh, hurdles and barriers that Henrietta is talking about? Thank you, John. I think we're very fortunate to have the analysis that Henrietta has just done, building on the statements from President Macky Sall and also from His Excellency Sultan Ahmed bin Sulayem. This is a world pandemic. It's not a pandemic in one or other country. It's every country in the world. This is a pandemic that hits poorer people the worst. We've got masses of evidence that shows that if you're poor, you don't come out of this pandemic as well as if you are uh, um, richer. You can help yourself is through terror. And we're being threatened with our job loss, our securities, financial loss. I mean, this is, it's horrible. That first they used fear, then they use guilt, then they use bribery, and now they're using force. That's how you manipulate people. Nancy Hill says she's a cardiac nurse at Bellingham's Peace Health St. Joseph Medical Center, where she was recently mandated to get a vaccine or lose her job. She says her rights and those of teachers shouldn't be any different than those of her patients. What we want to put in our bodies, we have that right. And if we don't consent, that has to be upheld. Anyone who doesn't want any medical treatment or a certain kind of medical treatment absolutely has that right to, to not consent. And as more mandates are handed down from Olympia, the divisions are growing deeper. It doesn't matter if there's a pandemic. It doesn't it doesn't matter because you it shouldn't infringe on your freedoms. And Inslee should not be able to take away our freedoms because he's not a king. Fully vaccinated Americans will have to roll up their sleeves again. Today, President Biden announced that a booster shot will be necessary to fight off COVID. The recommendation is to get the third shot eight months after your second dose. So this is only for those people who got Pfizer or Moderna. There's not enough data quite yet for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Miguel Almaguer explains how soon we could see those first booster shots roll out. And then thirdly, this is a pandemic that is constantly evolving and we have to learn while doing. That's why I am obsessed about the need for global interaction, global governance and global solidarity. If we can learn from each other, we can get on top of it. I certainly have learned such a lot over the last year about what's needed, as have all my colleagues working in public health. Why don't we just deal with it as a global issue? Why do we have to continue mm. to pretend that somehow it's up to individual countries to get ahead of it using their own devices and desires? When I listen to uh, President Macky Sall, my straightaway reaction is Senegal should have as much ability to access vaccines as the United Kingdom. Why not? Why is it that some countries are doing better able to do so than others? Because in the long term, the good of our world depends on equity and depends on trust. And without that, we're going to have a much, much bigger job ahead of us, not just for my own generation, but for my children and my grandchildren's generation. I think that it's really important that the World Government Summit continues to make the point that the world needs to be governed as one and not as 193 or however, other, however many jurisdictions we can count today. We've got to work together because the issues that we face as a world call for a global response. Hmm. I, I, I can hear the call, that's for sure. Uh, uh, how, do, how do you feel about the next six months to a year, Henrietta? 
Well, I think we've got a chance as a world. It's a race, all right. And to David's call, if we could do it globally, this is what will help. And it's globally, particularly focused on Africa. So if we can help Africa and the nations there, I think we will have a greater chance. Um, we need funding. We need manufacturing capacity. Uh, we need the great distribution companies, uh, such as the chairman's uh, DP World. And we need all of us working together. This light at the end of the tunnel that comes with vaccines has to shine for all. Okay, thanks very much. President Saul, uh, it's great to have you and your, and your input uh, throughout the session. Uh, Chairman Sultan bin Sulaim, Dr. David Navarro, uh, and Henry Etcher Four. Uh, it's great to, to see you all, and thanks for a very lively debate here at the World Government Summit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Henrietta. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Good President. Evening. My pleasure. Thank you, John. Thanks Thank very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellencies, and our distinguished speakers on that very important discussion on the immediate steps necessary to move forward beyond the pandemic. Making it official today, the first booster shots for the general public will go into arms September 20th. After the FDA and CDC sign off, most adults fully vaccinated for at least eight months will qualify. A top priority, protecting health care workers, nursing home residents and seniors who were vaccinated first. The booster shot a third dose of the same formula and vaccine for those who were fully inoculated with Pfizer or Moderna. It will be easy. Just show your vaccination card and you'll get a booster. For those vaccinated with Johnson & Johnson, a booster will likely be needed, but for now there's simply not enough data. Citing multiple studies with a variety of date ranges, today the CDC released complex charts and bar graphs containing vaccine data on Pfizer and Moderna. But the takeaway is simple. Over time, vaccine efficacy against infection has declined, meaning your chances of catching the virus increase. Still, effectiveness against hospital while slightly decreasing, remains relatively high. Perhaps the biggest concern, the threat from Delta. This graph showing a significant drop in efficacy. We are concerned that this pattern of decline we are seeing will continue in the months ahead, which could lead to reduced protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. While the fully vaccinated still have a layer of protection, the CDC estimates likely near the eighth month mark after inoculation, antibody levels decline, saying a booster increases them by at least tenfold. Well, you know, I think that uh, the twin shocks of the COVID pandemic, together with the uh, worsening trends of climate change that we are seeing today, has really forced a rethinking of many of, of the policy frameworks that we have for energy, for sustainability, for management of cities. And I think that the mantra now has become that as we recover from these crises, we need to build back better, build back better. Uh, and, and building back better in as far as uh, cities and energy is concerned, I think that there are three key areas where we're going to have to focus. One is that the future of energy for cities is going to be much more decentralized. It's going to be much more digitalized and digitalization and AI are going to play an increasing part in a virtually every aspect of, of uh, 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 development of energy and particularly of the management of cities. And decarbonization is going to become a premier focus of how do we achieve an energy future that doesn't take us to uh, uh, above 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, climate change warming. So this is a huge challenge, but what we are seeing are so many encouraging shoots. Uh, as far as uh, uh, energy and technology are concerned, we know that the future of energy is going to become increasingly uh, uh, 
electric. Electricity is going to become a principal energy carrier in the future. Uh, that a large part of this electricity is going to be renewables, that renewables are now the cheapest source of power in the world. And by 2025, or before, in my view, 2025, we will have the majority of a share in power generation coming from renewables, so leading to a decarbonized source. I think the whole issue of transportation within cities and, and the movement of people within cities will become a critical issue. So the electrification of transport, uh, autonomous mobility, management of uh, zones for transportation uh, are becoming increasingly important to how cities of the future will function. And I think the encouraging thing there is that we are seeing that the cost of this is decreasing uh, exponentially and that cities will have to become smart. We will have to have smart infrastructure. We will have to digitalize the various components of that make up a city productive elements, residential elements, transportation elements will become increasingly digitalized. We have huge advances in the application of AI and learning algorithms and how to manage these uh, various parts of urban development. And we're seeing now that uh, uh, as uh, digitalization increases, uh, the uh, importance of efficiency comes to the fore. Efficient buildings, energy efficient, efficient transportation, to say to the people of Queensland, we want to keep you safe. And the best way to keep you safe and to keep Delta out of Queensland is to build as quickly as possible a regional quarantine facility. I have listened to Queenslanders. I know how much they support a regional quarantine facility to be in Queensland. They want their community kept safe. That's what they're saying to me and we are delivering it. This is a race. We are up against a highly infectious Delta variant that's sweeping the world. We don't know what's next. We need to get these facilities up and running. And everybody has seen how successful Howard Springs is.